All right, so it's a, it's, it's a real pleasure uh, today to have our own uh, Sandy Chang. I know that uh, some of you that are on the mailing list uh, were expecting to see uh, Enrique uh, De La Cruz. He had a family emergency and had to cancel, but he will be on the list uh, for this uh, next fall. Uh, Sandy uh, is uh, the uh, Associate Dean for Science uh, in Yale College, uh, uh, Science Education. He was an undergraduate here at Yale. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that he took chemistry when I was a junior faculty member here, so that makes me feel like I've been here in a long, long, long time that uh, I potentially could have had Sandy in class. Um, uh, Sandy got his BS in uh, 88, uh, went to Cornell Medical School. He'll tell you more about his uh, background. He's uh, been a faculty member at our medical school for some, not, some time now. And uh, as I'm sure you're all excited to hear, he's going to tell us today about the telomere cancer connection. So uh, join me in welcoming uh, Professor Sandy Chang. Thank you, Kurt, for that no nice introduction. And welcome, all of you, to Yale Science Saturday. Uh, let's see. Let's see if this works. OK, so I hope some of you at least got to see the demonstration I had outside when I had set up three microscopes looking at normal cells and three microscopes looking at cancer cells. And I just wanted you to, to know, for, for those of you who didn't get to see it, we actually looked at cancer cells from a person named Henrietta Lacks. Some of you may know this name. Henrietta Lacks was an African-American lady who unfortunately died from cervical cancer in 1951. But her contribution to science is immense because her cells live. Even though she died, her cancer cells was biopsied, put in a dish, and they grew. Her cells were the first human cancer cells to grow. No other human cancer cells in the past was able to be grown in the dish. So, let's see what's my, what's my thing. So this is Henrietta Lacks. If you want to know more about her, this is a fantastic book uh, written by Rebecca Sklut, The Mortal Lives of Henrietta Lacks. So we got to see um, her cells, which I use a lot in my own laboratory, versus normal cells. Okay. So before I go on, I want to see in a show of hands, how many high school students are in the audience? High school students, raise your hands up. OK, a few high school students. How about middle school? Oh, mostly middle schools. Elementary school? We have a few too. All right, great. Now, I'm the type of professor who loves to ask questions, and I want to hear answers. OK, so don't be shy about raising your hand and answering my questions. And in fact, there will be a special prize for, for the student who answers the most questions. I'm not going to tell you what prize it is. You have to wait for it. All right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about me and my career as a scientist. So I was born in Taiwan, and I came to the U.S. when I was seven years old. I grew up in New York City in the Bronx and went to an amazing high school called the Bronx High School of Science. Some of you may have heard of it. Bronx High School of Science generates a lot of scientists, but it not, doesn't only do science, okay? So I don't want to give you that impression. So I did a lot of science fair projects as a student, and this is me. 34 years ago, when I did a project in astronomy, I actually built a telescope, hooked a detector to it, and looked at the light curves of these stars called variable stars and figured out that they change the light shape because they have a big star spot on them. You know the suns have sunspots, right? These stars have humongous sunspots, like covering quarter of their surface of their, of their sphere. So when the star rotates, the, the light comes up and down, and I used my telescope to actually make a light curve out of it. I was fortunate enough to be selected as one of the 40 finalists in this, it was called a science talent search. Now it's called the Regeneron Science Talent Search. And this is us in Washington, D.C. We actually got to meet President Reagan in those days. This is me right here. And the cool thing about being in a science fair is not just the science that you do, but the people that you meet. So these are my fellow science talent search winners. These are the New York winners. And we got to meet all these Nobel laureates. So this is Leon Letterman, this is Glenn Seaborg. These are Nobel laureates in particle physics. So they imparted a lot of very useful and, um, advice to a junior scientist. So I was fortunate enough to be selected as second place winner. I won a $10,000 scholarship to Yale, which in those days was a pretty good money, right? $10,000. Now the prize money is $250,000 for a first place winner. So you kids, if you get one of these prizes, your, your parents will be very, very happy because they could go, you guys could go to college without them paying a cent, right? 
So this is me um, in my glory days, but I still do astronomy in my spare time. This is my observatory in my backyard that I built myself. You can see that I got two retracts, and here's my telescope. So I go out on a clear night and do my thing. I still do various, very, variable star astronomy, and actually my daughter has done some of this as well with me, so I'm very happy about that. But I am not an astronomer, so that goes, that's one thing I want to tell you is you could be interested in many different phases of science. You don't necessarily have to do it as a profession. In fact, if you do it as a, as, as a hobby, it's even better because there's no pressure to actually produce. You can just have fun doing it. Okay, so what else did I do? Like, as Kurt told you, I was a Yale student. Actually, I sat right over there um, 30 years ago taking general chemistry and organic chemistry right in this very room. And I majored in molecular biophysics and biochemistry, which is the major that if you come in as a Yale student, I think is a really amazing major. You learn to do molecular um, biochemistry. And I worked in Yale labs as an undergraduate. And I have more to say about that. Then I went to a combined degree program. I'm an MD, PhD. That means I have an MD degree and a PhD degree. So I'm a physician scientist. So this is actually a very cool combined degree program. It's a seven year program that gives you both degrees and it's absolutely free. It's very competitive to do, but many of our Yale students get into these programs, right? So it don't cost any money. You don't have, you're not in debt coming out of medical school as a doctor. So I had a lot of other training after getting my degrees, after seven years, and I went to do a residency in pathology over at Harvard Medical School. So I trained as a doctor. I'm still a doctor. I still see patient samples, but I'm a pathologist. I don't see patients per se. And I also trained for more science. I went to a lab to learn how to, to do more science. And this is the science that I'm going to tell you about today, which is telomere biology. So more training as a scientist. And then I came to Yale, came back to Yale in 2010 as a professor. So I'm a professor in the School of Medicine. And I recently became the dean of STEM education at Yale College. So for those of you who don't know what a dean is, a dean is just a guy who gives a lot of advice. Okay, so I'm going to give you students some advice as we go along in this, um, in our progression today. So my first advice for those of you who are interested in doing science is that it's great for you guys to come here to listen to scientists talk like, like me, but to do science, you got to go and do it. Okay, you got to go and do science fair projects. I think those are the, those are the ways for you to really get involved in doing science. So for you middle school students, I suggest you talk to your science teachers if you're interested and do a project. There's so many cool projects now on the internet to get for you guys to get ideas. Many more sources of, you know, to get science ideas than when I was a student. So talk to your science teachers about doing a science fair project. And the Connecticut Science Fair is a great venue for you guys to present your science fair research. And in fact, you could, you could even make prizes. You could make um, earn money. Anybody here have done Connecticut science fairs? Okay, so one. So I want to see more hands go up as, as, we, as, as we progress. So for the high school students in the audience, I want to give you a tip. And my tip is, if you're over 16 years of age, you can actually come to Yale to work as a, as a, as a summer student. You just have to pester the Yale professor that you're interested in working with, email that person over and over to get your foot into the door. Okay? Now you're... Chances of getting into a Yale lab is greater if you start doing some science fair project in middle school. Then you're going to build a progression. The professor is going to say, hey, you know, this kid has done a lot of cool science fair projects. He's interested in science, and he's shown by, by all these projects done. Maybe I'll give him a chance, but, or her, him or her a chance by bringing him or her into the lab. Okay? So 16 years of age, come to Yale to do a project with a professor. And then you can enter your project into one of these contests. I did my project on my own, but that's kind of rare these days. So if you want to work in a Yale lab, that's a very good thing to do. And the other advice I want to tell you is, if you're interested in becoming a scientist, go to a college. This is for the high school juniors or seniors applying to college. Go to a college that emphasizes undergraduate science research, especially a place that will give you money to do research. A lot of colleges don't do this, so you have to do a little homework. And it doesn't really matter what college you go to. What matters is that you go to the best graduate school. So four years of undergraduate, if you do a lot of research, it doesn't matter if you come to Yale or to another school, 
But if you do a lot of undergraduate research, and you can get into the best graduate school, and that's important. Okay, so that's my advice. Okay, so I want to talk to you about my, about my research, but I want to use a patient of mine as the segue. So this is a real patient. I'm not going to tell you her name, but her just initials LC. When I met LC, she was only 15 years old, okay? M much like where you guys are. Many of you are 15 years old. Two months before her 16-year-old birthday, she started feeling tired. She's normally a, a, a very healthy person. She used to run marathons. Why does she become tired all of a sudden? She can't even walk to the ends of her driveway. And then she started developing these little blotches on her skin, okay? And then what really got her scared is when she started brushing her teeth, she started bleeding profusely, right? Normally when you brush your teeth, you shouldn't bleed. So her teeth started bleeding and then came to the doctor and that's how I saw her. So what are you guys thinking? I want this, all my, my teenage student scientists are thinking. So what are you guys thinking? What do you think has happened to LC? Yes, kid over there. Why do you think cancer? All of a sudden, this is a 15 year old. 15 year olds don't get cancer. Yes. Well, you're gonna talk, you're gonna speak up loud. <laughs> okay, this talk is, uh, this is a very clever kid. This talk is about cancer, so I'm gonna talk about a patient with cancer. Okay, v very good, yeah. yes. So why would, why would you suspect cancer if, if the kid is bleeding excessively? Why? Blood not clotting. Do you hear this kid? She said blood not clotting. That's why you start bleeding profusely. That's a very good sign. So what test do you want to do? What easy test would you want to do with this LC? She's at your clinic. You're, you guys are doctors. What easy test? Yes? Speak up. Blood test, exactly. You do it very easy. You, pin, you, you make a pinprick, put it on a drop on a slide, make a smear. This is what her smear looks like. This is a normal blood smear, red blood cells, white blood cells. Look at LC's blood smear. What do you think here? What are these? Are these normal cells? Do they look normal to you? Do they look like these cells? These are neutrophils. These are normal white blood cells that fight infection. Do we see any of these guys here? We see these crazy, tell me their size. Are they big, small? Big. They're big, they're giant. They're big, giant cells. Okay, good, very good. You guys go be pathologists. Fantastic, all right. So let me tell you a little bit about how blood cells mature. Okay, normally you have something called a myeloblast, which is a stem cell. Don't worry about the name. You know, the thing in science is there's a lot of names, okay? Don't worry so much about the name. Just think about the concept. So anyway, this myeloblast turn into what's called a promyelocyte. Does this cell look like anything that you just saw? No. LC cells, right? And these promyelocytes then go through all these things and they become a neutrophil. Okay, so why do you guys think we only see this promyelocyte in LC cells, but not all these normal cells? What happened? Could I call on people that haven't raised their hand? Yes. You gotta talk up. Okay, that's a good thought, but that's not exactly what's happening. They're not all forming together. How about that kid right there? You, yes, you. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. You gotta speak up. They're not functioning as they're supposed to, exactly. So instead of turning into neutrophils, LC cells are stuck on the promyelocyte stage. You don't make any other cells. That's all you see is these type of cells, okay? And she has what's called acute promyelocytic leukemia. She has leukemia. Somebody here said over there is absolutely right. She has leukemia. She has a blood cancer. Very, very scary disease. This used to be fatal. 30 years ago, if you have this disease, you're dead. 100% death at 15 years of age. That's a very sad prognosis. Luckily, this is a very rare disease, okay? So with LC, with something, ha oops. something happens that this the normal differentiation, I'm gonna throw a few words out there. Differentiation means the changes from this cell to this cell, differentiation is blocked. 
So normally when you go from this white blood cell blast, the myeloblast, to neutrophil, you go through these stages, but this is blocked right at the promyelocyte stage. So the question is why? Why does this happen? Okay, so let's, let's explore this question. A very famous scientist look at the chromosomes of patients with acute promyelocytic leukemia. Chromosomes are units of genetic material, for those of you who don't know. We have 23 chromosomes from your mom, 23 chromosomes from your dad. If you look at the chromosomes, what's in every acute promyelocytic leukemia is a switch between chromosome 15 and 17. It's called a 15-17 translocation. Chromosome 15 breaks, chromosome 17 breaks, they switch places, here's 15, here's 17, break, break, switch places, now you get a, a hybrid chromosome 15 and a hybrid chromosome 17. This is not good. And this is diagnostic for this disease. All acute promyelocytic leukemias have this type of translocation. The chromosomes break and switch places. Okay, so let's go one step further and ask why this happens. So what happens when chromosomes, so chromosomes are where genes live. You could think about chromosomes as a library. It's a library of your genetic information. The books in the library are the genes, okay? So think about if you take a library, you have two libraries from two different towns, if you chop them in half and put the libraries together, maybe sometimes you're gonna chop a book in half. You're gonna chop a gene in half and you're gonna stitch two genes that are nothing to do with each other together. And that's exactly what happened with LC. So chromosome 17 normally encodes a gene that makes a protein called red oak acid receptor alpha. Okay, don't worry again about the name. Just remember that chromosome 17 has a gene, a blue gene. Chromosome 15 has a gene that has multiple colors. It's called promyelocytic leukemia gene. Both of those genes have normal functions. They tell their myelocytes to differentiate into neutrophils. That's their function of these genes. What happens with LC in all patients with APML, acute promyelocytic leukemia, is that there's a break here and there's a break here and you get a weird gene that's made. What's called a fusion gene. The fusion gene will make a fusion protein which is a cancerous protein. This protein is a new protein only arising from this switch, this translocation, and this protein blocks differentiation, okay? Because remember I told you normally these two genes are involved in differentiation. Now you chop them in half, make a new gene, it's not gonna work. So that's why these cells cannot differentiate. They're stuck in the promyelocyte stage. If you're stuck in a promyelocyte stage, like, like the woman, the girl in the pat over there said, you can't make white blood cells. You can't make platelets. That's why you start bleeding, because you can't make normal cells, right? Normal blood cells are needed to stop bleeding, stop infection. So what do you think about Elsie's chance of getting infections? Is it high or low? Very high, right? She had no neutrophils to fight off infections. That's why this is a bad disease. So what I want to impress with you is, this is a disease in which there's actually a break in genes, in DNA. And that's what cancer is. Cancer is a disease of the genes. Cancer is a genetic disease. All cancers are due to mutations in genes. In LC's case, it's particularly these two genes. Yes? So quick question. So this is not random. I mean, is, it, is that unusual for a cancer, or is that typical of many cancers? That's a great question. This is not random. 1517 translocation is characteristic of this disease. I'm going to tell you why this is in my, in, later in my talk. Okay, so, like I said, this new cancer protein that's generated from this break and then joining blocks differentiation. So normal cellular differentiation is blocked in patients with acute promyelocytic leukemia. But, thank goodness there is cure. Okay, I wouldn't be here talking to you if there's no cure. It so happens that a drug called all trans, no, trans retinoic acid, or ATRA, can actually bind to this cancer protein and blocks it. This is research done totally serendipitously. People were testing different compounds, they didn't know what they were doing, and just came upon this just by chance in the 70s. And amazingly, it works. 
So all transthoracic acid changes the, the stuck promyelocytes and then allows them to differentiate back into neutrophils. And this is a drug that was given to all APML patients and it is curative. Yes. Yeah, speak up. That's a great question. So neutrophils are white blood cells. So all the white blood cell lineage get, gets blocked. There's other two pathways in, 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 in blood formation is not blocked. It's not just neutrophils. So with LC's case, she was cured. This is one instance when a drug can actually cure patients. She has to be on this drug forever. And thank goodness there's little side effects with this drug. And now she's a mom, which is fantastic. But this case illustrates, again, that cancer is a genetic disease, right? Cancer is the disease of the DNA. That's why people say you shouldn't go out to the UV. You don't want to you know, be exposed to ionizing radiation because UV light mutates DNA. Similarly, gene breaks, gene fusions also cause cancer, like you see with, oops, with, uh, with LC's case. And another thing that I want to emphasize is you don't have to kill cancer cells to treat them. So a lot of the cases you know, with radiation therapy, with chemotherapy, the aim is to kill cancer cells. Don't necessarily have to do that anymore. If you could change a cancer cell's biology to make it differentiate into normal cells, that's the same thing, right? The cancer is not completely gone. She still has the cancer cells around. It's just being suppressed by this drug and it's not affecting the normal cellular function of uh, white blood cells. Yes, you have a question. What is this pass down to children? Did, like, the cancer pass down? Can this be passed down to children? That's a great question. So is this mutation, so how do you get a cancer that's passed down to children? Where does the mutation have to be? In the gene. Which gene? What, uh, what cells? In any gene? Okay. Only in the germ cells in the sperm cells or in the egg cells. Only in those mutations do you get passed down to kids. Her mutation is in non-germ cells, so she will not pass this down to her kids. But that's a really good question. Other questions? Yes? She has to constantly take this drug. Yes, she has to constantly take this drug because this protein is still being made. You're not getting rid of this protein, you're just blocking this protein from, from its evil functions. So unfortunately, you still have to take this drug. But that's, taking this drug is better than dying. Yes? Um, I'm not going to talk about breast cancer, but 2% but of breast cancer is inherited. Most of the breast cancers are not inherited. It cannot be passed down. Yes? I was going to say, um, you were talking about germ cells, and I was noticing that the translocation seems simpler to the translocation that occurs during meiosis naturally between maternal and maternal genes. Is there a similar process involved in the um, irregular translocation? He's asking a very sophisticated question between meiosis and mitosis. These breaks are not meiotic. These are mitotic breaks. Okay? They're not the similar breaks. Meiotic breaks are different, and they don't involve um, uh, 1517. But that's a very good question. The, the breaks mechanism are similar, which I'm going to get into. Okay, so I have, to, I have to go on. So if I were just a doctor, I'll be happy with just treating the patient, right? I give LC the drug. She's living, and she's, she's fine. But as a scientist, I'm not satisfied, because scientists is always asking why. So the question is, why do breaks happen, right? Is it, that should be like kind of like in your mind. Why are breaks happening? Why do gene fusions cause cancer? OK, so that's the question I wanted to address. So to address this question, you have to, we have to go to another topic, which is a thing called telomeres. This is going to be the focus of my talk. Telomeres are these structures at the ends of all of our chromosomes. In fact, they are at the ends of every eukaryotic organism. They're composed of long stretches of DNA that encode the repetitive sequence, TTAGG, that's repeated thousands of times. TTAGG, TTAGG, TTAGG. It just keeps on going, okay? And so this is a chromosome, like I showed you before. And telomeres are at the ends. So here's the ingrained our telomere DNA. And these are telomeric sequences, OK? So just remember that. And telomeres, you can think of, if you don't remember anything, remember this slide. Telomeres are the ends of, like, like the little plastic caps at the ends of your shoelace, 
Okay? You can, somebody in the street randomly asks you, what's a telomere? You can say, they're, they're like the little plastic capsule and it's my shoelace. They protect my shoelaces and make them functional. Which is exactly what they do. So here is caps at the end of the shoelace, but you need them to thread them into the holes of your sneaker. If they become frayed without the cap, your shoelaces are messed up, and we call those dysfunctional. So telomeres, when they become dysfunctional, are no longer functioning, okay? They don't have a proper function. So think of telomeres at the ends of your shoelace, and when they're no longer functional, they don't exert the normal cellular function. So I'm going to tell you what telomeres do and why is this important in thinking about LC's cancer. Okay, so telomeres are, as I said, at the ends of our chromosomes. But because of, I'm not going to explain why, but because of these weird things that happen, normal cells, when they divide, they cannot copy the ends of telomeres. Okay, that's just, a, that's just what's happened in eukaryotic cells. So what happens when the cell divides over time is that the telomeres get shorter and shorter and shorter. You can think of telomeres also as a biological clock. In fact, look at your parents around you. They have shorter telomeres than you guys do, right? Because they've lived longer. They have many more rounds of cell division, okay? So in 99% of our cells, telomeres are shortening. Our skin cells, our organs, our you know, cells that divide. Only in our stem cells do telomeres are maintained. And they're maintained by this enzyme called telomerase, which is shown here. Telomerase is the enzyme that maintains telomere ends. This is the immortal enzyme. If you have telomerase in your cells, your cells will never, never die. They will just keep on dividing forever and ever and ever and ever. Okay? And it's because telomerase prevents telomeres from shortening. And if you don't shorten your telomeres, you could divide forever. I'm going to tell you why in a second. So this is telomerase. And remember, telomerase is only in 1% of our cells, which are stem cells, but in 90% of our cancer cells. 90% of all our cancer cells express telomerase. Because cancer cells, as you probably know, divide like crazy. They're immortal because they grow, 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 grow. They don't stop until either you die or you do something to kill it. That's why cancer cells are so lethal, because they're immortal. And the reason why they're immortal is because they turn on this enzyme telomerase to maintain telomere ends. So it is utterly important for every organism to maintain their telomere ends. You can't live with short telomeres, and I'm going to tell you why. Okay, so how do we look at telomere length? Telomere length and different chromosomes are, have different sizes. So we could run, the, we could chop the telomeres up with an enzyme, run it on a what's called a gel. So you could separate out telomere length by size. And what you actually get is a smear, okay? So here's a representation. Here's your chromosome. Here's telomeres, the two ends of your chromosome. They get shorter, as I said, as you divide, cellular division, right? Parents, your telomeres are getting shorter, unfortunately. Uh, grandparents, your telomeres are like down here, okay? Nearing senescence. Senescence is a phase of the cells when they stop dividing. Okay, I'm going to tell you more about senescence. So here's cell division. Telomeres are getting shorter. So here's a smear. You look at telomeres like this. They're getting shorter, 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 shorter. And then here in cancer cells, they don't get any more shorter, but they don't get longer either. They reactivate telomerase and maintain the telomeres at a stable or short length. Okay? So if you look at normal human cells, these are, again, somatic cells, no telomerase. Look, these are white blood cells. If you look at people from 60 to 100 years of age, look at the telomere length, you can see, yes, indeed, they do, telomeres do shorten about 70 base pairs per year. Okay? So again, telomere length can be used as a biological clock, a clock of aging. Okay, so I'm going to link this concept of cancer and aging together in a second. Okay, so now we know telomere shorten in all of us, except for our stem cells. So if you were to look at stem cell telomere length, what would you get? Who's smart? What? Straight line. Straight line what? Up, up and down like this straight line? Across. Across. Very good. So, you get, so, so stem cell telomere length would be like this, right? because they don't shorten over, over time, because they express, what do stem cells express to make the telomeres long? No, they do divide, but they express telomerase, the enzyme telomerase to maintain the telomeres, okay? Okay, good, so what is the consequence of short telomeres? Gene fusions, chromosomes start sticking to each other. 
This is one of the reasons why chromosome fusions occur in a patient like LC. Short telomeres causes chromosome. So here's one chromosome in blue, okay? These red dots are telomeres. But if you have short telomeres, the telomeres get so short, you don't see a red dot, but they start sticking to each other. So these are the chromosome fusions that we see in LC, the translocations that we saw with 1517. Here we have a lot of translocation because I, I experimentally shortened the telomeres down in these cells by a great deal. So you can see here, these chromosomes, like this chromosome, the very short telomeres, you see these two little red dots, is smaller than these two dots. So these telomeres have shorter than these, and the shortest ones have started sticking to each other or fusion. So short telomeres causes gene fusions. Yes? Um, what makes, what lets cancer uh, cells, like, you said that 90% of them have, have, like, that whenever they reproduce, the telomeres get shorter. Like, what causes that for, like, Cancer cells not to have and why, don't, and why doesn't every cell have it? Okay, so the 90% of cancer cells reactivate this enzyme telomerase. So remember I said that the telomere is really, really short? Then they turn on telomerase and they keep their telomere short but no shorter. So it's okay to live with a short telomere as long as you don't get any shorter to activate all the bad responses we're going to talk about in a second. So cancer cells all turn on this gene called telomerase the enzyme is working to maintain telomeres. So that's why they're immortal. Okay? Why don't regular cells? Why don't regular cells turn on telomerase? That's a really great question. And the reason is because we are long-lived organisms. We have long-lived organisms. One of the drawbacks is that we get cancer. So nature has evolved a way to make us not get cancer very frequently by getting rid of telomerase in most of our cells. Because remember I said telomerase expression is associated with cancer. So we don't express telomerase in our cells because we age, we accumulate mutations. If you have telomerase in your cells, you can get cancer very easily at a young age. We don't want that. So this is a byproduct of the fact that we are a, a group of beings that age for a long time. We have, we're long-lived organisms. Yes. Ah, that is such a great question. You guys are asking, asking amazing questions. So in some, I'm going to tell you about why. So can you hold that question for a second? That is a fantastic question. Okay, so I told you that short telomeres causes gene fusions. I'm never going to finish my talk with all these questions. These are amazing questions. So this is what's happening. Okay, I'm going to link short telomeres with cancer. So if you have short telomeres with advancing age, you're going to get gene fusion, chromosome fusions, because short telomeres fuse. That's a by hallmark. And fused chromosomes are very unstable. They undergo the cycle in which the chromosome can get broken and repaired, called fusion, fusion bridge, bridge, uh, bridge cycle. So the, the chromosomes are fused, then they get pulled apart when the cell divide, they get broken, and all of this causes cancer to form because it, it makes, again, translocations between two potential cancer-causing genes and they form what's called carcinoma in situ. This is an early form of cancer. Most of the cancer cannot progress beyond this early form of cancer called carcinoma in situ. In fact, if all of you, all of us older people may already have carcinoma in situ, we just don't know it because they develop and not, nothing happens. They don't get any worse. The reason is because carcinoma in situ don't turn on the enzyme telomerase. Remember I said 90% of human cancer have to turn on telomerase? Only when you turn on telomerase do you become an amazing, aggressive, invasive cancer. That's when cancer kills you. Not when it sits in your colon and forms a little nodule. That doesn't kill you. Cancer kills you because it becomes metastatic and invades, and it goes to your brain and gives you a stroke and you die. Okay? Or it goes to some other organ and it just blocks organ function. That's why cancer, is when it becomes invasive, is very bad. That's why you have to do annual checkups, right? Annual checkups, hopefully you catch cancer at this early stage, you could get, get rid of it. But at this stage, it's very hard to get rid of. Yes? You say that 90% of cancer activated telomeres. Like telomerase. Telomeres. I know there's a lot of lingo that sounds very similar. That, that leaves 10% of the ah. not activated. I was wondering who's going to ask that question. So the 10% of cancers that don't activate telomerase, they activate another program to maintain telomeres. Okay, Though that's a program 
that's telomerase independent. There's another way to make telomeres longer. I'm not going to go into it today because it's very complicated. I actually studied this in my lab as well. But it doesn't require telomerase. And in fact, the most aggressive brain cancer, glioblastoma multiforme in the brain, activates that program. So some of our most aggressive cancers activate a telomere maintenance program that doesn't require telomerase. But 100% of all human cancers have to activate a telomere maintenance program. You've got to maintain your telomeres. Like I said, short telomeres kills you. So 90% turn on telomerase, 10% do this thing called alternative lengthening of telomeres or ALT, telomerase independent. I'll be happy to talk to you more about it after, after this lecture if you want. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about the flip side of it. So we talk about, about telomerase, telomeres, and cancer. I wanna talk a little bit about aging, okay? So if you look at cells, if you take normal human fibroblasts, normal human skin cells, and put it in a dish, and grow it. Do you think that these cells will grow forever, like the HeLa cells that we saw outside? Why do you think they won't grow forever? Yes. Yes, yeah, so you have been listening. Great. So these cells have short telomeres. They get, and then in fact, that's exactly what happens. So when this, this scientist named Leonard Hayflick did this experiment in the 1950s, he took normal human fibroblasts out, put it in a dish, grew it, and he thought, you know, normal human fibroblasts is going to act just like HeLa cells. Remember I just told you that HeLa cells grow and grow and grow, they grow forever? These cells don't grow forever. They only grow to be about 60 passages. You could tr transfer them to 60 plates, and that's it. Then they stop dividing. So look at these cells. These cells look pretty healthy, right? Here's the nuclei. They look like they're in pretty good shape. What do you think about these cells? They look like what? They don't look like when you were shaking the egg and then you were That's exactly. Oh. I love teaching this class. In fact, that's what we call it, an egg, a fried egg morphology. They do look like fried eggs. In fact, sometimes they have binucleated cells that look like they have two egg yolks, OK? These are what's called senescent cells. Senescent cells are cells that don't divide anymore. They can't divide because they have very short telomeres. And in fact, you know, for us older people, that's what we've been getting in our organs. We're accumulating senescent cells as we age, OK? So what is the linkage between senescent cells and aging? And the linkage is because aging is completely due, not complete. I don't want to say completely, because there's other causes of aging. But aging is 90% due to the accumulation of senescent cells. And large part of the senescent cells come from short telomeres. There are other ways to get senescent cells I'm going to tell you in a second. But aging is because we are organs that normally function so well for 60, 70 years, start failing us. Why do they fail us? Because the normal cells, oops, keep on like doing this. The normal cells that are normally functioning well, every time they divide, the telomeres are getting shorter. So you're accumulating senescent cells as we age. You know, accumulation of maybe 10, 20% of senescent cells is okay. But if the number of senescent cells, like say your heart, gets too much, your organs are going to stop working less well. And that's, that's a sign of aging. Aging is really defined when your organs don't work so well, right? Your skin is not working so well. Look, a young person's skin versus an old person's skin. Dramatic difference, right? And there's increased cancer in older people as well. So in senescence, it's really due to DNA damage. And telomere, like I said, shortening is just a form of DNA damage. DNA damage can come from getting, the sun, getting too much of the sunlight. You get too much IR radiation. Chemotherapeutics. Unfortunately, one of the side effects of getting cancer treatment is that you age because the chemotherapy is damaging cancer genes, cancer cells genes, but it's also damaging normal genes. Chemotherapy doesn't distinguish the old-fashioned chemotherapy doesn't distinguish normal from cancerous cells. It's just cancer cells are more sensitive to the chemo agents. They're still killing the normal stem cells. That's why you vomit, that's why you lose your hair, right? Your normal stem cells are, are, are gone. So chemotherapeutics are bad because it damages DNA. Cancer-causing genes, oxidative stress, you know, the oxygen that we, we breathe, that's not a good thing. Anyway, so all of these things cause DNA damage. And DNA damage is read out by another thing I want to tell you keep in mind, it's a protein called P53. Protein 53, the P stands for protein. This is a very important protein. I want you guys to remember this protein as well. 
P53 is the guardian of the genome. It's like the sensor. It senses DNA damage, and it tells the cells, OK, you have too much damage. I'm going to shut you down. And the way to get shut down is to go into a senescent program. Remember I said senescence that happens when in a normal fibroblast you get passes 60 times and you get short telomeres. And short telomeres are functioning just as a damage, DNA damage, activating P53, then bring you into the senescence. So senescence is normally a good thing. Senescence is the anti-cancer program that eukaryotes have evolved. Okay? The drawback of senescence is aging. But it's better to age than to die from cancer. So that's the trade-off eukaryotes have made during our billions of years of evolution. Long-lived organisms age, but they develop cancer less because of this program. Is that clear? Yes, Sam. Does uh, P53 also, doesn't P53 also regulate apoptosis? Yes, absolutely. So senescence and apoptosis, I'm not even talking about apoptosis today. P53 does two things. P53 tells the cells not to divide, which is senescence, and in very severe cases, it tells the cells to kill itself. Die. It turns on a program in which the cell will die. Cells with too much DNA damage that's irreparable will die. So you can see that P53 is a really important program. So what do you think happens when a patient has no P53? What do you think when a patient is born without P53? Yes? Um, if it doesn't have the, the Yes, go ahead. Exactly. So what happens when you have self with a lot of damage? What do you think happens? Would you get cancer or no cancer? I'll probably get cancer. Yes. You hear this little girl? That's absolutely right. So if you don't have P53, you're going to accumulate all these DNA damage, and you're going to get cancer at a very early age. And in fact, we have patients called leaf from many patients who inherited, unfortunately, a copy of mutant P53 from their parents, and then one copy that's normal, and when the copy of normal P53 is mutated, when you lost both copies of P53, you can get cancer at the age of 18 months. Really young age to get cancer, right? So P53 is absolutely important. In fact, 80% of our human tumors all lose P53. So if you look at human cancer, this gene is mutated. It's gone. But it takes a long time to mutate it. That's why we age. We get cancer late in life because it takes a lot to get cancer. You need to have DNA damage from short telomeres. You need to have P53 loss. So short telomeres by itself is not enough. Loss of P53 by itself is not enough. Only with this combination, the synergy of telomere dysfunction and P53 loss, do you get on the pathway to cancer. Yes? You got to talk out. I can't hear you. Actually, that's a very good thought, but she doesn't have bad P53. So normally you lose P53 when you're old. LC did not inherit a mutation in P53, so her P53 is actually normal. Okay, so I told you a lot bit about cell culture work. What about in an organism? So when I was in my postdoc days, we actually made a mouse in which we knocked out the telomerase gene. So here's a mouse with no telomerase in every one of their tissues. So what happens is that the telomere shorten as we predict, and look at this mouse. This is a mouse with very short telomeres. It looks weird, right? It actually has aging phenotype. It has like this hump back. It loses its hair, and it dies very early. So this is a direct, and here's the telomere length. So if you look at normal telomeres, it's like sort of like a Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution, and it clusters around here. This is about 5,000 units. That's, long, that's normal telomere. If you don't have um, the telomerase gene, the telomere is short, right? So your telomeres are short. So this is the first direct proof that telomerase is needed to maintain an organism's health span. If you don't have the enzyme telomerase, like in this mouse, all the stem cells don't work well. That's why these mice age. And the short telomeres activate P53 to cause an aging phenotype. So this is direct proof in a mouse, in an animal model. And it's likely to be true in humans. Obviously, we can't experiment on humans. This is the best we could do. But this mouse shows signs of premature aging due to telomere dysfunction. Now, what happens? Let's see how smart you guys are, because I think you guys are pretty smart. What happens if I mutate P53 in this mouse? Now this mouse has very short telomeres, 
and has no P53, what do you think happened? Let me, you know, let me ask this, this kid a question. Yes. Get cancer. They could get cancer, yes. So in fact, these mice with short telomeres and no P53 get cancer very early. Now you have a way of DNA damage, fusions, and no P53 as guardian of that, you're gonna get cancer, absolutely. Okay, so I'm gonna summarize this part of the talk with this diagram linking aging, cancer, and telomeres. So you guys should all know this because this is what I've been talking about. In normal somatic cells with no telomerase, telomeres shorten with each round of cell division, right? This is a, that's what's happening right now with us. So very short telomeres is viewed as damaged DNA. Damaged DNA activates P53, which is a sensor for damaged DNA. It's a guardian of the genome. So when P53 gets activated, it turns on the senescence program to tell the cells to stop dividing. This is a good thing because these cells with short telomeres and damaged DNA, will, if they don't stop dividing, they will give rise to cancer. So P53 is blocking cancer by telling these mutated DNA damaged cells to stop dividing. What if you unfortunately lose P53 in, in the cell? Then remember, genes are mutated stochastically all the time. That means random mutations happen. If you just are unlucky that you, lose, you have a cell that loses P53, this is what happens. Telomeres will shorten, but the short telomeres will not activate a protective program like senescence. The cells will continue to shorten the telomeres, and in fact, what they will happen is they will reactivate telomeres if given enough time. Telomeres will maintain the telomeres in cancer cells. These cells will become cancerous. Now they have telomeres, they have short telomeres, no P53. Again, as that kid right there predicted, or, or you know, the little girl predicted, sorry, cancer progression, right? So you have two flip sides of the coin. Either you, you age or you get cancer. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Of course, we do, we do link these two together, right? You age, cancer ca happens as we age, and it's because it takes time to shorten your telomeres and to lose your P53. And so this is given by this graph here. So this is the incidence of cancer with age. So as you know, cancer increases with age, right? So LC is a very aberrant phenomenon. Most kids don't get cancer. Cancer, we know, is associated with advancing age in, in, in older adults. And that's because telomeres shorten, right? So you have this threshold. We get very short telomeres and a cancer incidence, and that's when cancer occurs. Yes? Um, when the DNA um, uh, mutates, yep. Yes, short telomeres is not the only way to get mutation. I'm obviously focusing on that because that's my research. But you can mutate DNA in many other ways as well. As long as you damage DNA and you also lose P53, you will get cancer. Okay, so let me show you some human data. So these are people that we follow, not we, but the collective we. So here's cancer incidence. So people with the shortest telomeres have the highest cancer incidence. People who just happen to have longer telomeres have much lower cancer incidence. Look at the difference, especially with follow-up in terms of month. This is like a five-fold difference. So hopefully every one of us here have long telomeres, right? So it's protective. So look at cancer death, so death from cancer. So again, segregated from the shortest telomeres with the longest telomeres. Look at this rate of death. That's like a tenfold difference. If you have very short telomeres, you're gonna die from cancer at 10 times higher frequency than with those with long telomeres. Again, you're born either with long or short telomeres. There's nothing really you can do about it. So this is, this is unfortunately, this is just a random thing. So look at, this, look at this progression. So actually, there are a lot of companies now, you probably have seen some on CNN, that are actually testing for telomere length. Not that they could do anything about it, but they could just tell you, okay, you have long telomeres or short telomeres. I'm not sure what that information is gonna help you with. But, you know, it's not like we could go and extend our telomeres. Okay, so the, what's happening here is so if you look at plot telomere length with age, all of us are doing something like this, right? Our telomeres are shortening. You know, somehow we're going to get to some kind of threshold with disease risk is going up, and that's when we get cancer. That's why cancer happens around 70 or so years of age. But there are some people you can imagine with mutations in telomerase. So what do you think is going to happen with those people? If you have mutations in the genes that encode telomerase, actually here, telomerase doesn't work. What do you think is going to happen to those people? Yes? Exactly. So this is the rate for mutations in people with telomerase. So they're going to hit the disease risk 
at around 30 years or so of age, you know, just hypothetically, right? Because their slope is much sharper than this guy. So here's us. We're going to hit disease rate around 70. They're going to hit it at 30. And in fact, we can actually do a diagnostic and look at telomere lengths to predict whether these people are going to be, are going to come down with diseases. So if you look at telomere length, remember I said telomere length is usually this Gaussian distribution, a normal distribution. So here's four, uh, five patients, patients one, two, three, four, and five, okay? So this patient, this patient, and this patient all have somewhat a normal telomere length. I drew a red line through it. This patient have just longer telomere length. It's on to, it's shifted to the, to the right. Look at this guy. This guy has short telomeres, and in fact, very short telomeres. We, look, we use other measures to look at the length of the telomeres, and in fact, they have much shorter telomeres than the other patients, other th four patients. And in fact, the number of chromosomes with very short telomeres is about four times higher. Okay, so you can actually, this is actually a, a molecular diagnosis that you could do for patients. So this patient with a short telomeres actually has a disease called dyskeratosis congenita. I know it's a weird name. These patients have very strange nail phenotype. They have like, you know, plaques in their mouth, but the worst thing they have is they have bone marrow failure. Remember, bone marrows are the fastest dividing components of your body. You can imagine that these are the components that are gonna shorten the telomeres first, because they're dividing so fast, especially if you have an infection, you gotta rev up your bone marrow, right, to produce all those white blood cells. So these patients come to us at 30 years of age with bone marrow failure. And they also get cancer, it's called AML, they have this type of cancer, and they have this thing called full pulmonary fibrosis. And if you measure the telomere length, they're all shorter than even one percentile. This is a plot of telomere length. Normally you're here somewhere, and these are the patients. Very short telomeres. So short telomeres are a type of syndrome, and it can cause causes disease. They actually have aging phenotype, cancer, and they die very early. So what we, what we would love to do as clinicians is to be able to move the disease progression up. So now I told you that telomeres are shortening like this. So what if we could delay that shortening? What if we could, instead of 70 years of age, let's delay it to 100 years of age? Could we do something like that? What do you guys think? Sam? Well, you could go up to the face like Scott Kelly did and get a I don't believe that data. That's a, that data is N of 1. I, I, my colleague did that data. I totally don't believe it. OK? You can't conclude anything. Remember, if a scientist was N of 1, one sample. If you have 100 cosmonauts or astronauts and you show delayed telomere loss, I, I'll buy that. Not with N of 1. Even if you have a twin control study, no. No, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so I, I don't like that then. But there's something that we can do. I, I already told you. There's something that potentially we could do to increase telomere length. What could we do to increase telomere length? <laughs> telomerase. See, this kid has been listening. What if we introduce telomerase? That was, a, you know, people would be talking about this. We discovered telomerase. What about giving telomerase to people to increase their telomere length? Wouldn't that shift the axis up to prevent aging? Okay, so we give telomerase to cells. So here's an assay for telomerase. I'm not going to talk into it. But remember I told you that I showed you telomeres and smears, right? They get shorter and shorter as we age. Look at what happens if you put in telomerase. Telomeres get longer. It really does lengthen telomeres. The enzyme is working, especially at high copies. Look, telomeres are increasing. Remember, it's cell senesce at 60 population doubling, 60 passages. This is what normally, without telomerase, they stop dividing. With telomerase, they're immortal. They're growing, growing, growing. Isn't that a good thing? Why, is, why, is it, why do some people say no? It's not a good thing. Well, yeah, I mean, you three, I won't call on you. How about you in the back? Yes, yeah, speak up. Yes. Telomerase have the undesirable side effect of promoting cancer. So again, you can't have your cake and eat it as well. So here is the good and bad thing about having telomerase. So yes, if you add in telomerase, you do slow telomere rate loss. You do improve immune system. We've demonstrated this in mouse models. You can slow down this breakage fusion generating fusion genes like we, that we see in LC. You do activate renewal and you do reduce senescence. 
So aging is reduced. But the flip side is increased cancer incidence because now you're favoring any cell with mutations to live, right? Because you endow them with immortality. And if they lose P53, forget it. You're going to get cancer. Yes? Is there a way to like, decrease the rate of cell division? If you increase, uh, so actually the biggest mutation in, for cancer is cell division. So you don't want to increase cell division. You want to decrease cell division. But then you, then you can't grow. Well, in adults, after they have grown? Hmm? After they have grown, in adults. Oh, yeah, that would be, that's the, that's the holy grail. If you become an adult, if you can manipulate P53 levels, we can maintain, ma manipulate cell division levels, that would be fantastic. We can't do that. <laughs> cell division is the number one generation of mutations. Because when we replicate our DNA, we, there's errors that's made. It's not just from telomere dysfunction. But errors in DNA replication contribute to cancer pathogenesis. And as I said, every time you divide, you shorten your telomeres. OK, so giving telomerase in theory is a good thing. But in practice, it's probably not going to be FDA approved because of this risk. You don't want to give something that you know, may have marginal effect in terms of age, uh, lengthening the age of people. But then you're going to have to run the risk of getting cancer. Right? You don't want to do that. OK, so the, my final slide is a summary of what I talked about. So telomeres shorten with normal aging, right, with each round of cell division. Or you have premature aging syndrome like dyskeratosis congenita, that people are born without the enzyme telomerase. Their telomeres are shortened. And the short telomeres activate a DNA damage response. Damage DNA is just like any other damaged DNA from ionizing radiation, chemotherapy, or whatever it activates a P53 dependent checkpoint. Remember P53 and DNA damage. So if you have P53 in your cells, which all of us hopefully do, P53 will sense this damaged DNA, telomere dysfunction, and says, OK, you got to stop dividing. Because if the further you divide, you're going to become cancerous, and that's not good for the organism. So they undergo senescence. And it can also trigger apoptosis, as Sam alluded to, which I'm not going to talk about. But both of these processes can contribute to an aging phenotype. That's why we age. Okay? But if your cells have no P53, just by randomly lost P53 when you're 75 years of age, that one cell is going to have the endowment of short telomeres, no P53 to check the DNA damage response, undergo this crazy breakage fusion bridge cycle, leading to gene fusions, like we saw in LC, cancer happening. Now, somebody asked me, I think it was you, why does LC, being a 15-year-old, does she have broken DNA that happens when you have fusions that occur? Right? Normally, I've been telling you that this only happens when you're like an old person. The reason being, as I said, telomere length are inherited. Some people are endowed with short telomeres. In LC's case, she just had unfortunately shorter telomeres than normal. And that's what gave rise to this type of fusion. And I think you asked the question of this is whether this is, this 15, 17 is not random, and it is not. The reason why this chromosome translocation is not random is that chromosomes live in territories in the nucleus. So chromosome 15 and 17 just happen to live near each other. So when there's a break, they just happen to join with each other. Okay, so that's why you don't see chromosome 1 and 15 making this type of cancer. It's always 15, 17, because they live near each other. And if you're near next to your neighbor, you're going to be able to fuse easier. Okay, so this is the link between aging and cancer. And it's all due to telomere shortening and the P53 checkpoint. Thank you very much for your questions. I love it. And I'll take any more questions if you want. We got some great questions. Amazing.